All right, Doug, I'm going to go ahead and open up the waiting room to get people uh, comfy in here. All right, I've started the recording in the live stream, and I will go to you, Anna, for 2 o'clock. Sounds good. All right, uh, bonjour tout le monde. And on behalf of all of us here behind the scenes, welcome and welcome back. At Concordia University's fourth space, we ask, what does research look like? What are folks across the university working on with their community collaborators? And how can we connect people to those initiatives, research projects, and dialogues? It is therefore our pleasure to welcome in our collaborators from the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability for three days of conversations and presentations celebrating Indigenous expertise in sustainability. This is day two. Thanks so much for being here with us once again, those of you who have come back today and this afternoon for this very special keynote address with Danica Billy Littlechild. Uh, for the official welcome, it's now my pleasure to pass the floor to Jim Grant. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Anna. You, you do the official welcome so much better than I do. So uh, I'll just <laughs> reiterate a few things. So yes, welcome to our final event on day two of our three-day conference on uh, sustainability across disciplines with our theme on celebrating indigenous expertise and sustainability. We can't say that enough. So I like repeating that. Uh, much of our research in sustainability is about land or places that are really important to each of us. So I think it's particularly important to begin this session with a territorial acknowledgement. I think Rebecca might share a screen for us. Uh, I, I acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands, the custodians of which are recognized as the Ginnakahaga Nation. Uh, many of us attending today are, are from in and around Montreal, which is also known as Jajoge. But if you're tuning in from somewhere other than Montreal, I uh, would like to learn more about uh, whose land you're situated upon. Rebecca will pop something useful into the chat that will help. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so our final event today is a keynote address by a distinguished visitor. Um, I will pass things over to Monica Morenin to introduce her. But first, I should say something quickly about Monica. She's a professor in our Department of Geography, Planning and Environment, and has long been interested in Indigenous rights, knowledge, and stewardship. So we're delighted that she's agreed to introduce our distinguished guest. And also, thank you, thank you, Monica, for running that great session yesterday and, and the other one this morning. So I, I feel like we are asking too much of you. But over to you, Monica. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our conference keynote speaker, Danica Billy Littlechild. Uh, Danica is a member of the Amerskin Cree First Nation, Niaskiwak, Muskwakish, in Treaty Number no. Six Territory, Alberta. She is assistant professor in the Department of Law and Legal Studies at Carleton University's Faculty of Public Affairs. Her expertise is wide ranging, including indigenous legal systems, governance, international law, health, environment, water, sustainability, conservation, protected areas, and, and many more areas. 
Prior to joining Carleton University in early 2020, um, Danica practiced law um, in Canada for almost two decades and advised Indigenous people across Canada and internationally. She was uh, an advisor to the North American uh, representative um, on the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues from 2013 to 2016 and was uh, General Counsel for the International Indian Treaty Council from 2011 to 2018. She was the first Indigenous woman to be appointed Vice President of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. She served in that role from 2014 to 2018, after more than a decade of service to the Commission. She's also served as an advisor and Indigenous Peoples representative in various UN mechanisms, including her involvement in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals as a member of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group. Danica has served as co-chair of the Indigenous Circle of Experts, ICE, under the Pathway to Canada Target One initiative and was co-author of the groundbreaking report, the 2018 report, We Rise Together, which outlined a vision for the creation of Indigenous protected and conserved areas in, in the spirit of and practice of reconciliation. In that role, Danica was instrumental in facilitating a greater understanding of ethical space and in helping others involved in the pathway process to understand um, how to contribute to its creation and maintenance. To advance that important work, Danica is currently leading the ethical space research stream of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, the CRP, which is a seven year program of work funded by a Shirk Partnership Grant and hosted by Isaac Ulam Foundation, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative and the University of Guelph. Uh, the CRP, where I've had the great privilege of getting to know and work closely with Danica, is a partnership of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people uh, united in the goal of supporting Indigenous-led conservation in Canada. Danica is involved in numerous other projects and collaborations, including being a co-applicant of a New Frontiers in Research Fund, one of those big 24 million uh, 2020 transformations award. Um, that project entitled uh, Aramat, Strengthening Health and Wellbeing Through Indigenous-Led Conservation and Sustainable Relationships with Biodiversity. Finally, uh, Danica is a recipient of the Esquio Award for Justice and Human Rights from the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women in Alberta, as well as the Alberta Aboriginal Role Models Award for Justice in 2021. One year after starting at Carleton, she received the Carleton University Student Association's Teaching Excellent Award. I should add this amazing woman is uh, also holds, as you can see, the important job of mum to, uh, to Pablo. <laughs> so we are hugely grateful to Danica for finding time in her busy life to join us today and very excited to hear her keynote address. Welcome, Danica. Hi, hi, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm joining you from the uh, territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe um, in Ottawa. And yes, my son is here. So there may be disruptions, but we will do our best to get through today's presentation. Um, and I'm just really, really excited to uh, be part of this important event and um oh my goodness it's the uh there we go <laughs> i can never find the play button here okay so uh this important event to uh celebrate indigenous expertise which thrills me to the core to be honest um because i think so many of us have been talking about how we can try to get indigenous peoples recognized as the experts of themselves, of, of their um, connections and relationality to the natural world. Um, so I'm very thrilled to be here. 
Before we begin, I do want to tell you a little bit about myself um, and situate myself. So um, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm from Treaty 6 from uh, Muscochis in uh, Neasquiac. And so there's a little bit of a map for you um, on the far side of the um, some of the historic treaties um, in Canada. And I've circled Treaty 6. And then sort of zooming in in the red circle is where I grew up, the um, community where I grew up, the reserve um, Ermanskin. And the one in black is the one where my mom is from, um, which is called Kihiwan Cree Nation. And there's some details there on the screen for you, including even in the red, the basic location of our family home <laughs> in Ermanskin um, Cree Nation. Uh, so um, it's always good to sort of have a geographical sense of, of where somebody is coming from. And both my parents are Cree uh, and Cree speakers. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit in the context of my background about talking how far away is history really when we talk about indigenous systems, when we talk about indigenous languages, cultures, practices, um, this photo that you see here is a photo of my grandmother. She's the toddler in the pigtails. And my great grandfather, um, Chief Dan Mind, who was the last hereditary chief in, uh, in Ermanskin um, after the imposition of the band council system. And I love this photo because um, they took a number of family photos um, on this day, I guess, um, dressed differently in different photos. Um, and, uh, and I think this is a great juxtaposition of what was happening in that moment, this massive um, transition um, of the world around our family um, and, and how that has sort of been reflected since. Um, so these are also um, some uh, family, uh, family um, photos. Uh, and you can see on the upper uh, corner, um, my great grandfather, Chief Dan Mind, with his family, mostly dressed in European attire. Um, and in the bottom, um, sort of tattered photo, is also my great grandfather, Chief Dan Mind, with um, his then grandchildren. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the sort of larger photo in the collage is of my, uh, my grandfather. Um, uh, Smith little child with my grandmother Justine, who is the toddler in the very early photo. Um, there with some of their children, including my uncle Tipsis, who had a really <laughs> important role in my life. He's the grinning guy on the corner of the photo, um, who was having clearly a great time having his photo taken. Uh, and my late dad is the one in the moss bag on his mother's lap. Um, you can also see a photo of my grandfather Smith, before he went to World War II to be a sniper, um, he uh, returned from that war actually and um, lived uh, a great many years. Um, and, I, and I had the wonderful opportunity to spend time with him as well as with my late grandmother, Justine, who you can see in the colorized photo as well. Um, on my mom's side of the family, my mom's side of the family is descended from Big Bear. So his uh, son, Imsis, is um, sort of the direct uh, ancestor of my mom and her parents, um, uh, Billy Dion and uh, Sarah Dion, late Sarah Dion, who uh, was also um, uh, Cree from the same community. Um, my mom's uncle, uh, Joe Dion, was the first uh, Treaty Indian to become a teacher, to have a profession um, in Treaty 6 territory and wrote a wonderful book called My Tribe the Crees. Um, and uh, my Aunt Madeline is also somebody who's quite well known, um, who uh, worked at Carleton for a great many years, has been an advisor to ministers and has just been hugely influential, in particular in the field of health. And my mom's brother, Joe Dion, uh, is equally as famous, but in the realm of extractives. He has been a huge um, uh, promoter of extractives and, and the work of oil and gas development in our territories. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my uncle Willie um, from the little child side of the family, um, who, of course, everybody knows the little child, who's been basically the person who 
uh, I think has been one of the primary architects of international law pertaining to indigenous peoples and has also been hugely influential, of course, in sport. And the beautiful woman with the heart is my mom, uh, Alice uh, Tanak, um, uh, little child. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys that quick snapshot of my family because I think it's important to know sort of um, as an indigenous person where I'm from and who I'm connected to. Um, both of my parents attended residential schools. My mom went to Blue Quills, what is now Blue Quills University. Um, and my late dad attended Ermanskin Residential School, which was actually located in community. And so since it was in community, they put up an electrified fence around the school, which you can't really see in this photo that I'm mousing over right now. But um, it was to prevent kids from getting out of the residential school and to prevent family from going in to see the kids. Um, and so um, I really feel like this has this era of residential school and the estrangement essentially of um, not just familial and kinship relationships, but also the estrangement of, um, uh, of generations of children from their own, um, the, their own cultural um, practices, from their knowledge systems, from their languages. Um, and I think it's quite, um, it's quite incredible that anyone got out of residential school speaking their language. And I was very fortunate that both of my parents managed to retain their language um, in spite of um, basically spending the entirety of their childhoods at residential schools. Uh, and so I think that's really important, an important part of the um, history in the context of Canada with respect to when we talk about like indigenous expertise in, in sustainability and in environment, um, just what everybody has had to sort of um, manage to survive in order to uh, exist as Indigenous peoples has been um, incredibly significant, I would say, in the course of my life and, and, and my history. So I want to also talk about some of the parallels that were happening um, over the past number of decades when we think about sustainability or sustainable development and Indigenous peoples. And in particular, I'm really just going to focus on international standard setting around sustainability, which I think has been what has been most influential, I would argue, in a lot of the national conversations around sustainability. Um, and I also want to sort of parallel that with what, what's been happening with Indigenous peoples and how the two have sort of interconnected. Um, sorry, just one, one moment, please. Sorry, I tried to think of everything, but clearly I didn't. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so, you know, in the context of the UN, work on sustainability and thinking about sustainable development began as early as 1972. By 79, there were already like three conventions. By 1980, the World Con uh, Conservation Strategy had emerged. There was like really a lot of momentum building um, in the mid to late 70s and early 80s. And it's really ironic because at that same moment, um, you know, the UN as an institution that was beginning to be sort of an arbiter of this concept of sustainability was simultaneously sort of rejecting the, um, the inclusion of Indigenous peoples at all. So, uh, so as Indigenous peoples, we were not allowed to set foot on UN grounds until 1977. I mean, I was three years old when that happened. That photo that you see is actually the photo of the very first Indigenous peoples ever stepping into UN grounds in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, there had been attempts, of course, um, you know, um, prior to that, but that was the first time Indigenous peoples were allowed through the gates um, to uh, enter the UN. Uh, with the hope of, I think, um, promoting their rights. And in the context of a time when there was a real awakening of Indigenous peoples in their advocacy and representation, excuse me, and their representation in not just the international stage, but nationally within, their, within the states and within which they were captured, essentially. Um, and so I think that that's um, a really big part of, um, for me, this juxtaposition between what's been essentially, do you want more? What's been essentially happening um, 
vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, sustainability and, and why it's been so difficult for the sustainability movements as, they, as, as they've been expressed in sort of um, mainstream to be inclusive of indigenous peoples. And, and I'm gonna get a little bit um, more into detail about that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, so part of what happened after 77 is that the UN convened um, what they called the Working Group on Indigenous Populations. And that is really, I would say, also sort of a place where Indigenous peoples were in effect contained in a lot of ways. They were really contained within that process. Um, so indigenous advocacy and participation was very much restricted um, to the, the meetings and um, the agendas of the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations. Um, and this photo is actually a photo of one of either the first meeting or one of the very first meetings held in the infamous room 12 um, in, in UN headquarters in Geneva, where indigenous peoples were finally allowed to be on UN grounds saying something about themselves um, and, and having interactions with um, civil society representatives as well as um, with states and UN staff. Um, so throughout this time from like 82 up until the UN DEC, there was these, there were the really important sort of um, watershed moments in the way we began to understand like who are indigenous peoples in the context of the international world and how should we understand who they are in, in, in a formalized way. And so um, there's a few of the ones that, that, that occurred to me that were important in, in shaping the way we developed this narrative of who indigenous peoples were vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, UN standards, for example. But, the, but throughout this time, okay, well, you go in the bathroom and mommy's gonna keep talking, okay? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, one second. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so all of this is happening, all this different initiatives around indigeneity and what does it mean to be indigenous and sort of explorations of, of all of these topics were happening at the UN. But simultaneously, I mean, there was so much happening at the UN without indigenous peoples because we were over here, you know, I'm um, trying to describe who we were to the world. Meanwhile, there's really fundamentally important standards that are that are being developed um, in the same time period. And these are just like a few notations on them. For the most part, indigenous peoples were not uh, were not strong participants or even participating at all in most of what I've listed here. Um, and and I think it's important to know that because um, where we find ourselves now when we're thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we go about um, dealing with reconciliation in the context of sustainability or in the context of conservation or biodiversity? It's hard because all of these concepts have been so entrenched within the UN system to the exclusion of indigenous peoples that it's incredibly difficult to see what the synchronicities and the convergences might be and how to create space for indigenous peoples appropriately um, is has been definitely challenging. And I just wanted to show you sort of, um, you know, in the same moment that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, we finally see the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples passing at the UNGA. Um, with Canada voting against, US, uh, Australia, and New Zealand voting against. And throughout all these years of negotiating the UN DEC, while all this amazing work is happening around environment and sustainability, um, you know, Indigenous peoples were over there trying to just make sure that there was an S at the end of peoples. I mean, 
The S at the end of peoples, believe it or not, took 11 years to negotiate in the context of the history of the UN declaration negotiation process. Um, indigenous peoples would wear t-shirts that had S's on them to the negotiation. Indigenous peoples had a hunger strike to try to get the states to agree to put the S at the end of peoples. And why? Because states were very concerned about the application of the UN Charter, which itself recognizes peoples as having self-determination. And there was a real fear that indigenous people's self-determination would endanger state sovereignty in the context of the UN. I'm so sorry. There's going to be lots of interruptions because he hates it when I'm on a Zoom or doing a meeting and he doesn't have my full attention. Like any child, it's totally normal. So um, I'm going to try to soldier through here and hopefully he can manage the next few minutes as well. Um, you know, and, and when in 2012, um, Rio plus 20 happened and, you know, there was this massive like the world we want summit which indigenous peoples had very little to do with the, the actual formalized summit. Instead, there was sort of a parallel indigenous conference on sustainable development and self-determination that happened with some of these ideas emerging from that that I've uh, enumerated in, in the text. But basically, you know, indigenous peoples were saying, look, like we're not captured in your text. We're not captured in your, your negotiations. You know, at the Rio Plus 20, you know, they gave indigenous peoples like every UN meeting that at that time and everyone since then, this has never changed. Indigenous peoples often get like three minutes to do a presentation on behalf of, you know, 450 million indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and so, you know, the idea is kind of laughable that the uh, outcome of the Rio plus 20 could have in any way truly uh, reflected um, indigenous peoples as experts, as, as um, holders of legitimate knowledge, um, that would contribute to the betterment of Mother Earth. Um, and so there was a lot of folks who, um, who were, <coughs> excuse me. Can you put a coat on if you're going outside, please? <coughs> there was a lot of folks who were trying to understand like what difference could the UN declaration make in the context of these standard setting processes around um, around environment and sustainability um, and a lot yes I'll be right back okay super fast please okay um, okay so there was a lot of okay thank you thanks uh, there was a lot of um, speculation okay. There's a lot of speculation about uh, what influence the UN declaration would have on standard setting, on thinking about you know, how we would um, be able to participate in UN standard setting processes. What difference would this make for operative text of future standards, et cetera. But it's so unfortunate that at the very next opportunity in the UN system, uh, which was the intergovernmental negotiation on what became the Minamata Convention on Mercury, that France and the EU essentially, France and the UK in particular, led the charge to uh, completely block the inclusion of the phrase indigenous peoples with an S, uh, to block the inclusion of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and to do so, they said, based on their own national laws. They, I, I had so many conversations with France about this. I talked to lawyers in France. I talked to the whole French delegation. I met with the head of delegation. Um, I talked to Le Monde. Like I, you know, I was one of five indigenous peoples part of this intergovernmental negotiation process for the Minamata Convention. And to be quite frank, you know, France just was so recalcitrant, completely refused to shift their position to include indigenous people. So this is what we ended up with, a very incredibly weak preamble that characterizes us as communities. Why does that matter? Because only including the phrase indigenous communities in an international convention 
has the effect of making uh, the application of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People sort of discretionary. And not just in the context of states, but also in the context of the UN system. Even though there's a clause in the UN Declaration saying, look, UN system, you guys have to implement this. The UN system has actually been quite, I would say, fearful or like resistant to applying the UN Dec and has been very, very um, sort of, um, you know, um, allowing states to lead uh, the, the narrative around how and when the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People sort of comes into the conversation around environment or sustainability in the UN system. So right after that, of course, we began the negotiations for the SDGs. And um, once again, <laughs> You know, uh, we were faced with a scenario where, yes, Indigenous people sort of had a seat at the table in, in the context that Indigenous peoples had a major group which could contribute to negotiation processes in New York City at UN headquarters there. And Indigenous peoples had very specific things that they were um, advocating for. Um, but once more, France led the charge uh, to exclude completely any mention of Indigenous mm -hmm. peoples of the UN DAC. It was Minamata all over again. And uh, and I remember being approached by uh, the head of uh, G77, who was a state rep for Bolivia, who approached me and said, look, like you indigenous people's major group have to convince France to back down on their hard stance around the exclusion of any mention of indigenous peoples and any of the goals and targets of the SDGs. Um, and, uh, and it was, and it was sort of like, it felt pretty defeating to be frank, because, uh, when we were in the Minamata negotiations, I mean, like I mentioned, like I spoke with, you know, lawyers from France in a conference call. I spoke with all the delegation and can you shut that door now that you're inside, please? Okay. Uh, and so I just really wasn't sure, like, what more can we do? But, uh, you know, we, and, and France was completely resistant to even having long conversations with us. So I remember approaching the French delegation after being approached by Bolivia and asking France for some time to talk to them about their position on the inclusion of indigenous peoples in the SDGs. And the head of delegation said, Danica, you can have 10 minutes come to my uh, desk at six and you have to 610. So they obviously did not want also a redux of Minamata either. They didn't wanna go through the process that the delegation had done in the Minamata convention negotiations in Geneva where they spent a lot of hours with me and other indigenous uh, representatives. They, they wanted to just say, no, you guys got 10 minutes and that's all we're giving you. So we had 10 minutes. So I remember it was like, Six o'clock, I'm walking down the long stairs from the place where the indigenous people's major group and other major groups sat, including farmers, children and youth, et cetera. Walking down the long stairway towards um, the, uh, the place where the French delegation was seated uh, and, uh, and was first alone and then subsequently joined by other indigenous representatives. And basically we said to France, look, like you need to, um, you need to understand first that this is not uh, a legally binding uh, agreement, which in when we were in Geneva, France told me we will never accept for indigenous peoples to be an illegally binding instrument. Uh, I said, you know, that is not the case here. SDGs are not legally binding. And secondly, you know, it is totally inappropriate for France to impose its views and its national laws upon other states. So, you know, obviously you can point to the UN charter to say that um, states are not to uh, infringe on the sovereignty of one another in the context of the business of the UN, so to speak. Um, and I think that might have been a little bit of a turning point um, because um, what we were eventually able to do was to stay in a couple of the goals and targets. So this is an enumerated list of where we sort of landed in the SDGs. When we started the negotiations, I think we were in like nine and we ended up in two, uh, two goals and a few targets. So um, what does this all mean? Well, it's significant because at, at, while we're having all this parallel process about like, you know, empowering indigenous peoples and 
lifting indigenous peoples up through the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, et cetera, um, and, and talking and thinking about our land and resource rights, our treaty rights, um, thinking about collectively held rights, uh, self-determination and free prior and informed consent. None of that sort of has managed to um, manage to sort of have space created for it in the context of the global narrative and conversations around sustainability and sustainable development. Um, and so I think that that for me is part of what's been so challenging, I think, about thinking about indigenous expertise in the context of sustainability as a person who is a formal lawyer, I practiced law for 20 years, and now as an academic, I fully realize that there's been lots and lots of amazing instances over the decades in the context of the CBD, in the context of UNFCCC, in the context of the academy, there's been incredible work done where indigenous systems, there's an and, say hello, <laughs> where in the context of indigenous systems, um, you know, the, the engagement between indigenous and non-indigenous systems have been super positive and there's been amazing progress made. But I, I sketched this all out for you because I want you to sort of get a sense of the big picture, so to speak, in terms of what we as lawyers call the operative text of the world, like the, the, the binding stuff of the world, the stuff that states have agreed to and can be, and can be held accountable for. And, and I think um, for me, that is really, um, where there's a lot of opportunity now. I think we are very much seeing um, a little bit of a paradigm shift, even just within the United Nations itself, like in terms of the folks who work there, who are becoming more alive to the fact that they too have obligations in the implementation of human rights in the context of say, you know, um, MEAs like the no Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants or the Minamata Convention. Um, and then also we have like amazing allies amongst NGOs, universities, colleges, um, organizations, and just civil society in general. I think there's been a real um, transformative shift and I would love us to uh, leverage that and um, to try to engage in some ethical, uh, ethical um, spaces of convergence around indigenous expertise and systems in the context of sustainability. Um, and I would love for you guys to learn more about the Aramat project. You can see the link to the website there. And I hope that, um, I hope that the Aramat project does something focused on um, indigenous well-being and biodiversity and environment has the, uh, has the ability to contribute to some of this, um, some of these, um, you know, co-creation of ethical space um, around, um, you know, the fields of work like sustainability and sustainable development. And here's a few photos from my journey um, so far, um, with the exception I don't have a photo of my son in there, but uh, you know, um, in front of the uh, indigenous peoples um, seat, I'm there at the SDG negotiations. Um, in the bottom corner, I'm with uh, Andrea Carmen from International Treaty Council at Rio Plus 20, where we were at the indigenous site of Rio Plus 20. Um, the one with my back to the, uh, to the photo, I'm uh, doing an intervention on behalf of indigenous peoples at the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, where um, I was told repeatedly, Danica, like this is not a place to talk about human rights. If you want to talk about human rights, you go to uh, a human rights uh, treaty body. You don't come to uh, the Stockholm COP. Um, but, if it, but now uh, we've seen also that shift um, in recent years where finally civil society at the Stockholm COP, as well as um, Basel Rotterdam, sorry, <laughs> as well as Basel Rotterdam, uh, now embrace uh, conversations about human rights in the context of um, hazardous chemicals and toxins, et cetera. Uh, and I'm also uh, pictured in the bottom corner with um, the wonderful Francisco Kalitai, who's the current special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples doing really incredible work on trying to um, articulate through his um, ongoing studies, the connection between indigenous peoples, their systems, their expertise and environmental issues. Um, and, 
And, and of course, you know, my work with UNESCO has, has shaped um, a lot of my understanding about how we think about um, education, science, and culture through an indigenous lens. So I hope that this has been um, helpful in the sense that I've tried to sort of sketch out what I think has been a really important trajectory um, and sort of parallel paths that we need to find some connections. Um, and, and I think there's fantastic work that's being done by so many uh, different um, indigenous experts and academics and scientists. Um, and you know, amongst those that I would recommend you, you read you know, for the Academy is Max Libaron, uh, who uh, has done an incredible book called Pollution is Colonialism. Um, any of Kyle White's work, he is a prolific writer, uh, an Indigenous writer, and so very many others who are doing really, really incredible work um, on, in the field of sustainability and sustainable development. So I hope that this has been um, enjoyable for you. I do apologize uh, for the interruptions, and I would like to um, just be available for any questions or comments you might have. Thanks. Thank you so much. Danica for that incredible talk. Um, and thank you for sharing your son with us today. Are you able to stay for some questions? Yes, I can. He's you sure like he... outside. Okay. He's in the backyard. Look. He's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we absolutely appreciate this, that you're spending this time with us. So you just, you just leave when you have to, okay? Um, I can see a question from Monica. Go, go ahead, Monica. Sorry. Um, yeah, my question, Danica, is uh, just, uh, just be interested to know more about the challenges of um, maintaining a unified position um in your in your discussions within the indigenous group so at the un the kind of concessions and compromises and making quick decisions about how to move and and how difficult it was to maintain a united front in in the face of of that type of strategic positioning that has to happen at the un yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, one that is such a significant challenge. Um, so as I mentioned, I mean, really the, the normal process of indigenous peoples participate, participating at any UN meeting, including the recent ones like the UN uh, climate summits and, and UNFCCC COPs and everything um, has been to ask indigenous peoples representatives who attend to, uh, to make some, as you say, hard decisions about statements that they read to try to influence outcomes of these meetings um, and are often given three minutes max like every other civil society representative. Uh, and so this has, been, um, this has been sort of an ongoing issue. And I remember tweeting, um, uh, you know, Gutierrez, uh, you know, at the last UN climate summit. And I said, look, like you can't say that you're achieving climate justice if you continue asking 450 million indigenous peoples to be summed up in a three minute address, opening address and closing address. This is ridiculous. Like this is nowhere near what we need to see in terms of procedure around climate justice. And UN, you need to pull up your socks, you know? Um, but I mean, there's, this is something that is also very controlled by states as well. I remember very well one Stockholm Basel Rotterdam super cop, as they're called, that I attended, where the states wanted to change the rules of procedure to say only civil society representatives are the only organizations who are allowed to attend are people who have, are organizations that have bank accounts, Sorry, who have help. been recognized as um, uh, as say indigenous by their states, which as we know, a great many states do not recognize indigenous peoples within their borders. That's why you've seen the advent of a phrase called indigenous peoples and local communities. This is not a phrase intended to be inclusive of indigenous peoples. It's a phrase intended to protect state interests of states who do not want 
the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to apply to Indigenous peoples within their borders. So they characterize them as local communities. So lots of people don't know that. Like lots of people use IPLCs and they say, oh, this is an international standard. It's very good. No, no, no. Even within the context of the CBD. I got, I got all my toys from the storm again. That's great, buddy. I'm very proud of you. I want a long so I can eat. Okay. I'm going to continue talking if that's okay. So yeah, even within the context of the CBD, um, you know, we've seen uh, even walkouts of the Article H8 working group over this phrase, Indigenous peoples and local communities, because it's being used by countries like China, countries like in Asia, especially in Africa, places where they do not want to recognize Indigenous peoples. They say, no, we're dealing with local communities. That's why you saw the Billy. phrase indigenous communities come out in Billy. the uh, Minamata convention as Billy, well. Billy, Billy. So it's that really, so cool. well, that's why I told you to wear a jacket, buddy. <laughs> so it's really like, um, uh, so it's really about issues around representation, issues around um, ability to contribute. Um, and, and this is also impacting vulnerable groups within indigenous peoples as well. So for example, for a great many years, if you were an indigenous woman and you wanted to go to the UNFCCC COP, you could go to the indigenous caucus and you tell them, I want you to say something about gender implications of climate change. And they said, okay, we'll put a sentence in in, in our uh, caucus statement, which is three minutes. We'll put one sentence in towards the beginning about women and children. But you guys want to talk about gender, you should go to the gender caucus. So you walk over to the gender caucus and the gender caucus would say, oh my gosh, yes, you're right. Indigenous women do face a lot. We'll put a sentence in our caucus statement at the very beginning mentioning indigenous women. But if you want to talk about indigenous issues, you should go to the indigenous caucus. And this is how people with very specific holding multiplicity of identities, a multiplicity of being, being a part of a multiplicity of impacted communities, sort of converging in one whole person, um, made it quite uh, a reductionist sort of isolating um, experience to be an indigenous advocate, to try to bring in an intersectional lens was practically impossible. But now what we're seeing is we're hearing, you know, UN folks, you know, at, um, in, in training webinars, I, I've done a couple of training webinars for UNDP, you know, they are very now much more open to intersectionality. They are much more open to understanding um, that there is complexity there, that you cannot, um, you know, uh, always sort of resort to the comforting monolith um, approach and understand that there's um, huge number of layers to experience, to history, um, beyond what we've sort of managed to articulate so far um, in standard setting processes. And I think also that we're finally seeing MEAs, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, beginning to start to try to make room for human rights, for indigenous rights. Um, for the first time ever, a couple of years ago, OHCHR created a position for somebody who could be working on human rights and climate. That was the first time ever. We've now um, seen emerge a new human right on uh, the right to a healthy environment. That's the first time that's ever been articulated. So this is all kind of new when we think about um, the convergence of like things like indigenous expertise in the context of sustainability. We've always sort of shunted indigenous expertise as traditional knowledge that has a very specific utility to the wider world. But now we're starting to see, okay, indigenous systems are in fact complex. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Pablo. I think I, I will have to leave soon. I'm so sorry. I could probably handle one more question, one quick one. Okay, one quick question from the chat was, why was France so negative? What was, what? it's not like they have a lot they're, of- They're our people. former treaty partner. But you know what, guys, at these UN uh, negotiations, there's a heck of a lot of what we might call horse trading that happens. Uh -huh. So uh, countries might say, hey, you be the bad guy on this issue. 
push it for us. Um, and, and, and then we'll do something else for you. You know, we'll shift our position for you. So France really was the bad guy, um, for Minamata convention, as well as for the SDGs. And they were totally willing to wear it. Like they were, had no problems. France and UK, our two big former treaty partners here in Canada, can you right. believe? So, um, so that is something that we faced and managed to sort of, work beyond, but it was really, really tough. And um, I have to say that it's the toughest part of it is trying to express your indigeneity in a system that is designed to specifically exclude it. That is really the toughest part. How do you articulate something that's cognizable to this system when people just feel like it's totally inconvenient to them? It's, it's a drag, it's, it's dragging negotiations down, it's not helpful, you know, even civil society folks, you know, I went to um, a summit on food in Rome and I had, you know, the social movement statement, they didn't want to put indigenous peoples in. They said, no, if we put in indigenous peoples, we'll have to list everybody. And we just don't want to do that. <laughs> this is not the case though. Indigenous peoples are what we in law call sui generis, very unique in the context of connection to land environment, uh, et cetera. So this is something that's only changed within the course of my professional life and my lifetime. And I hope it, I hope it shifts much more as we move into the future. You Thank you. Honey? Thank you so much for sharing Pablo with us and squeezing us into your schedule. I think you should give us a talk on hope. I don't know how you say so positive and hopeful with that history you've been through. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone. <laughs>
really inspiring, touching uh, presentation on Wednesday morning, uh, has shared a couple of his films with us for a limited time only. Um, you can watch his full length documentary, A Brave New River, uh, through the conference website. And also there is a link to one of his short films, I Dream in Inu. Um, they are both well worth checking out. So please do take the time to do so while we have the option. Um, and with that, I will pop all of those links in the chat and I'll hand it back to you, Anna. Thank you, Rebecca. I applaud how much you can keep in your head all at once to share all this with us. We really appreciate you um, taking such care in organizing all of these events and keeping us informed uh, daily throughout every session. I think I'll just echo the chat, um, the applause that I'm seeing in the chat for, for Danica's talk. I mean, I think we all kind of collectively felt how important and powerful uh, her words were. So once again, just thank a big thank you to Danica for uh, being able to join us today. That, that was fantastic. And as Rebecca reminds us, you can revisit that or share it with those who weren't able to make it today. Just go to Concordia University Fourth Space and you'll see that's the first video that's there today. Uh, if you want to rewatch or revisit or share, etc. All right, folks, we're going to close up the Zoom and we will see you at noon tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye.